It was a military plane. And the plane wasn't no uh, airline or anything. It was a twin engine, big gray plane. We watched the first explosion yeah. as we were watching the building. We saw a black, very large airplane fly right into the second building. It came out of the south, right, right in front of our eyes. Just, it, it, it was so surreal, like a movie set. Were you close enough to be able to see any markings on, on the airplane? Um, it definitely did not look like a commercial plane. I didn't see any windows on the sides. I think a bomb went off in the lobby first, then a plane hit the building. But then another plane hit the other building. And But when I was coming through the doors on the other side of the Trade Center, something, either they blew the lobby up or, or something, because it blew the glass out of the doors and knocked us all down. You're in the building trying to help people, and it's exploding on the inside the building. So I don't think we're getting any worse than this. It wasn't, it wasn't from the jet fuel. No way. Stand. There may be more. Any one of these fucking buildings can blow up. This ain't done yet. See the firemen assembled here, the police officers, FBI agents. My name is Tom Sullivan. I work for Control Demolition Incorporated, CDI, the top rated explosive demolition firm in the world, owned by the Loazzo family during the years surrounding 9-11. And I worked for them as an explosives loader for two and a half years. As an explosives loader, my job was to place explosives in the buildings to prepare them for demolition. There are many uh, steps that you need to take. First off is uh, you have to weaken the building. To weaken the building, that means the staircase, uh, all the staircases have to be uh, cut at intervals. Uh, the uh, firewalls have to be removed. Electri uh, the uh, elevator shafts have to be cut. I look down to my right, and the elevators exploded, something out of like a Bruce Willis Die Hard movie. People just come running out of the, lo out of the elevators on fire, fireball. I mean, it was like, what is going on here? There's something's up here. I mean, the plane's up there, now there's fire down here. Then you have to move to the support columns on the particular load floors. And those are cut by a torch uh, for two reasons. First, to weaken them and also to uh, allow for charges to be placed uh, uh, onto the structure, onto the columns themselves. And that essentially uh, reduces their strength by about 20%. And even with all of that work being done to weaken this building, it still remains safely standing so we can work, continue to work in it. The story that just a few columns uh, can cause a synchronized global collapse, an implosion, is, well, that's just nonsense. I don't see how this could actually happen in real life. When we load a building, on a, we have to have all the support columns on a given load floor fail at the same time within milliseconds of one another and therefore the, uh, the, the entire building comes down in a synchronized uh, implosion. So I think this notion of a, of a one, column causing, uh, one column failure causing an entire building to implode in, uh, in a synchronized fashion is just nonsense. Looking at the building it wouldn't be a problem once you gained access to the uh, elevator shafts. How about an elevator modernization, which we know was going on the nine months prior to 9-11? Yes, Elevator World March 2001 documents it. In fact, they were in the middle of this modernization. There are people who noted that the elevators were locked in turn and that there were guards placed at these locked elevators during the modernization. Of course, you would have to have access to security 
Securicom was brought in. Who sits on the board of Securicom? Marvin Bush, the younger brother of George Bush. Then a team of loading experts who would have access to all the core columns and beams. The rest could be accomplished at that point by just the right kind of explosives for the job at hand. The choices are many out there. You wouldn't need miles and miles of debt cord. You could have used wireless remote detonators, and they have been available for years. Um, you need to only look at an action movie to see them in use, and of course the military has them as well. You want to call your mother or something? Uh, contractors don't use them on the other hand because they're just too expensive. Well, you wouldn't have found steel casings to be left in the rubble. They haven't been used for years. What we use now is RDX uh, uh, copper jacketed shape charges and when they're initiated there's nothing left of those uh, charges. And in the case of thermite, well, thermite self-consuming uh, cutting charges have been around since they first patented in 1984. So there would be nothing left in the debris pile except some uh, residue of molten iron. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel Molten steel running down the channel rails, like you're in a foundry. These incredibly hot areas were found at the bottoms of the elevator shafts, down seven basement levels. The molten steel was found three, four, and five weeks later when the rubble was being removed. He said that molten steel was also found at World Trade Center 7. The highest temperature was in the east corner of the South Tower, where a temperature of 1,377 degrees Fahrenheit was recorded. The molten steel in the basement was more than double that temperature. With uh, any implosion, you don't hear one massive uh, boom sound. What you do hear is smaller explosions going off. Mr. Sunder of NIST has said that you would, if this had been a controlled demolition, you would have heard a large, massive bomb going off. The World Trade Center, you can see the firemen assembled here, the police officers, FBI agents. What in reality happens with a controlled demolition is you hear a successive, progressive, smaller waves of smaller explosions going off. In the case of thermite cutting charges, you would have heard far less noise since they are worked by uh, thermal heating, melting of the steel, rather than an explosive cutting as in RDX charges. I knew from day one that this was a controlled event. And, it, and why I did that is because simply looking at Building 7, you have a, a sudden collapse of the building. It's fairly symmetrical as it comes down. There's the classic kink, which means that the center core fails first. And you can see that on the video. And the building falls near free fall. So I really honestly didn't believe this from day one because this is the way buildings classically come down with uh, a controlled demolition.
This material is not normal thermite. That's the other thing that really needs to be understood. Anybody could make normal thermite. You can get the ingredients, you can mix them together, you can make them. Any kid could basically do it if they knew the, the recipe. This material uh, is composed of the real key ingredient that I don't think anybody else could really make in a convenient way is the nano aluminum. It's a controlled substance. I could go buy it, but the government limits how much I can buy of it. Um, it's very, very difficult to produce in these sizes and to um, keep from reacting. It's, it's not something that you just get at the local five and dime or you're going to make on your own. It's a very, very um, difficult to make material. And that's the one thing in there that really tells me uh, specifically that this wasn't some guys working in caves in Afghanistan or it wasn't um, you know somebody in their basement doing this this was you know a massive engineering operation that made these materials so the military uses it for a number of different applications uh, another one if you do a search on Google for uh, thermite and building demolition you can find all sorts of wonderful devices that have been fabricated uh, and invented that use thermite for building demolitions An example would be that in 1984 there was a patent issued for thermite cutter charges to be used in building demolitions that could shoot molten iron through the structural steel in milliseconds. You can imagine when you assemble these chemicals on a large scale, the amount of heat that you generate. And then, who does Bush appoint? He appoints Henry Kissinger. Naming Kissinger sets a new standard for cynicism.